This video is being sponsored by Ratchet Clothing. I'll put a link to their website down below in the description to this video. Alright, we got a lot to cover so let's get started. Many people believe that the drug rule was a myth. When in fact the ban which stated that members could not be involved with drugs was a commission rule set in place for all the families. Besides the public, law enforcement, and politicians who all viewed drug dealing as inexcusable, the bosses who sat on the commission viewed it in another way. First and foremost, they wanted to safeguard their other rackets, which at that time was protected by crooked cops and politicians. Their fear was that drug dealing would cause a public outcry, which would put their other money-making rackets in jeopardy. One of the biggest concerns was the stiff and lengthy sentences that were being handed down for narcotics. Their thought process was the more time a member was facing, the greater chance of him cooperating. They also knew law enforcement aimed to fry bigger fish, so the ban doubled as further insulation for them. Commission members were fully aware that the root to all evil is money, and to deal with that, the crews in each family were permitted to take larger cuts as an incentive to stay away from the drug business. The flow of money always travels upwards to the boss and his administration. Certain percentages, based on the family, are expected to be kicked up by the crews. And we've all heard some stories where some bosses were greedier than others. So back then, it would make sense to lower the percentages as a deterrent for its members to stay out of the drug business. The penalty for breaking this rule was explicit. Get caught dealing drugs, you die. However, history has proved that wasn't always the case, but we'll get to that. Before World War I, in countries like Egypt, the penalty for narcotics was a maximum of seven days or a fine. Conversely, in China, the penalty was a life sentence or death. It wasn't until after 1925 when it became evident that heroin use had become a serious problem. According to reports, the very first place that heroin addiction became a major concern was here in the United States. Specifically, the main area of addicts could be found in New York. 98% of reported drug addicts were addicted to heroin. Whenever I'm asked a question about rules or protocol, I usually give the same response. There are exceptions to every rule. Cause or nostril rules, in my opinion, are essential. If you wear a uniform, be it of sports, the military, or in this case, a crime family, you represent that organization. And if you disagree with its rules, take the uniform off. Just like we in society have laws, without them, we'd have chaos. Rules set the stage and are the guidelines for how a guy in that life is expected to carry himself. Those same guidelines help expose insubordination. The rules help a boss maintain control as well as establish discipline to run a family. During an induction ceremony, and not only my own, others who have spoken about theirs all mention the no drug rule. What's funny is sometimes the person telling you the rule was heavily in the drug business themselves. In my situation, it happened to be Maddie Madonna. Back in the 70s, Maddie was supplying Nikki Bonds with heroin. And in 1976, he was sentenced to 30 years for conspiracy to traffic and sell heroin. So I definitely seen the hypocrisy in the rule. In Joe Bonanno's autobiography, Man of Honor, he states, my tradition outlaws narcotics. The law of high profits had tempted some underlings to freelance in the narcotic trade. Despite Joe Bonanno's strong stance on drugs, in October in 1957, he attended a summit in Palamo, Sicily with Carmen Galante. They met with other members of American and Sicilian Cosa Nostra. And although the meeting was in an effort to help the Sicilian Mafia create their own commission, supposedly they spoke about heroin, specifically the French connection. According to a United States Senate Judiciary Committee in 1983, they received a police report stating the Bonanno family had been deeply rooted in the importation of narcotics. Joe Valachi testified before the Senate committee in October 1963, and according to him, Frank Costello banned family members from dealing in drugs as early as 1948. He also said Albert Anastasia, who was known to be involved with drugs, would not participate in talks about a drug ban, which prevented the commission from imposing the ban. However, after Anastasia's murder in October of 1957, the five families were notified of the drug ban. The commission made it known in 1962, anyone caught dealing drugs could not be proposed for membership. As I said, there are exceptions to every rule. There are people who have been inducted when it was commonly known that they were in the junk business. According to minutes from a January 27, 1983 U.S. Senate Committee meeting, it was stated that illegal drugs and narcotic trafficking was one of the major criminal problems in the United States back then involving organized crime. 
nearly $80 billion in drugs was trafficked into the country per year. $80 billion. Drug sales for organized crime outranked major American corporations. On March 18, 1983, an organized crime task force team planted a bug in Sal Avellino's 1982 Jaguar XJ6, a car he often drove Lucchese boss Tony Ducks Corallo around it. The following is a recorded conversation picked up in the Jaguar between Tony Ducks and Sal Avellino. Forgive me, but I got to beep out the curse words. Tony Ducks. Now, I couldn't be any more fucking plainer than I was with some of these guys. Because I don't want nobody fucking around with anybody fucking with junk. They got to be killed, that's all. Fuck this shit. Sal Avellino. Sure, this is the whole fucking problem, the junk. They don't care about the gambling and all the other bullshit. They never did. It's the money. Tony Ducks cut them off. It's the fucking junk. Avellino then quoted former Senator Alphonse D'Amato. You heard D'Amato the other day. We got to put more prosecutors on. We got to put more of this on. You know, only he didn't say to eliminate organized crime. He says to eliminate organized crime in the narcotics business. He didn't say anything about gambling and unions. He just says narcotics business. Tony Ducks then turns to Avellino and asks a surprising question. Do you think they know we're not in it? By day, he means law enforcement. Sal Avellino answers right. And Tony Ducks adds, they know who's in it. Avellino agrees. They know. Tony Ducks then goes on to say, you can't be in the junk business without going in the fucking streets and selling this cocksucking shit. We should kill them. We should have some examples. All right? All right. We should make some examples. See, other people ain't like us. They talk a lot, you see. That's like an informer to me, see? They think they know what they're doing when they go and they talk to the lawyers and stuff. Say we kill the first cocksucker, you know, we'll kill him. We'll kill anybody with us, anybody near us, you know, we'll kill him. And he means any member or associate of the Lucchese family. Tony Ducks continues, don't worry, that gets to their fucking ears, see? Avellino tells them about a New York Times article. In the paper the other day, they tried to link you into the junk, too. They say everybody's in the junk business. Castellano, us, replied Tony Ducks. In April of 1982, Gambino boss Paul Castellano became aware of one of his members who were dealing in heroin. And that was Peter Little Pete Tambone, who was very close to the Gotti crew. The commission was split on Tambone's fate, with Castellano and Chinjiganti in favor of killing him, and Carmine Persico and Tony Ducks Corallo were undecided. Naturally, Angelo Ruggiero was trying to get Tambone to pass. He wasn't only attempted to help a friend, but trying to save himself too. Neil Della Croce got involved and was able to persuade Castellano to shelf Tambone, thus saving his life. Angelo subsequently ran into his own problems with Castellano. This took place after his August 23rd, 1983 arrest for heroin trafficking. I think we're all familiar with the domino effect that played out as a result of that. Paul Castellano gets killed and John Gotti steps in as the Gambino boss. The list of members and even bosses themselves that were former junk pushers is endless. Even Chin Giganti, who was known to be a stickler for rules, had a heroin trafficking conviction in the 50s along with Vito Genovese. There are many examples of members being involved in the drug business. The pizza connection, which involved both American and Sicilian Cosa Nostra, is most memorable. We could go on and on and on. Every family has a history of drug dealing. And despite the commission members implementing the no drug policy, some of its members couldn't resist the money earned from the drug business. Because if you receive money from the sale, you're just as guilty as the seller. Proof of this is every family had their drug guys, which bosses would turn a blind eye to. And when they turned that blind eye, they also had their palm open. There are numerous stories about off-the-record drug moves that were permitted. I'll end with this story. One night in 2017, I was in Big John's cigar lounge and his brother Bubsy approached me. He said he had pounds of pot, and if I knew anyone that wanted any, I could add to the price that he mentioned. Then he turned to me and said, in this life, you need to learn how to break the rules in order to make money. I never took him up on his offer. Unlike him, I didn't break the rules. I followed them. But Bubsy didn't only sell drugs. He was known to use them as well. In November of 2000, the FBI arrested members and associates of the Lucchese crime family, one being Bubsy. When the agents arrested him, his eyes were bloodshot and he reeked of marijuana. After a further search, the agents found a half a joint on him. Not only does he break Cousin Oster rules, but the rules of the drug game as well, because a successful drug dealer never uses his product. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that as well. By subscribing, you'll be notified every time I post a new video. Also, if you think friends and family may enjoy this video, share it with them. Thank you. Okay, till the next time.
You can subscribe to the Sit Down News blog at sitdownnews.com, and I appreciate everyone who has subscribed. Thank you. Well, just another example in the mob you never knew about. If you would like to subscribe to this channel, you can do so down below. If you would like to subscribe to my other channel, Unlimited Substance Podcast, I'll add a link in the description to this video.